All right, class, welcome to chapter 14 here, uh, coming from my uh, home base, my home office here. Uh, advising weeks really just killed me this week, uh, killed my free time, so uh, I'm forced to do this at home with my sweet uh, uh, change your long distance service headset here. I uh, don't have my cool setup like in my office, but uh, bear with me uh, and let's talk about development of the human brain. All right, so let's first talk about the different cell types uh, of within the CNS, the central nervous system. Uh, we have neuroepithelial cells, which are uh, these first most multipotent neural stem cells of the embryo. Um, and these make up the neural plate and the neural tube, which we've talked about in previous chapters, the development of the neural plate and the neural tube. Um, and so as this neural tube's developing, we have this apical surface, which is down at the bottom here, let me get my marker, and a basal surface. Now the apical surface is what faces the inner cavity where the spinal fluid will eventually uh, fill up. And the basal surface uh, is kind of the outside of the tube. And this terminates with these end feet. Uh, and these end feet, oops, my uh, marking's a little off there. Uh, my end feet are a swelling of the basal membrane uh, that faces the outside of the tube. So these basal membranes will come up and they will kind of swell out on the outside of the tube. Uh, and you can imagine the uh, apical surface on the inside, there's less surface area than the basal membrane or basal surface on the outside. So for these cells to come through, they have to swell to kind of fill that area on the outside. Um, and these cells are highly proliferative. Uh, so they, they reproduce a lot. So as you are well aware, neurons are cells that conduct electrical potentials and transform electric impulses into signals that coordinate bodily function, whether it's uh, digestion or muscle movement or responding to smells or scents, etc. Um, the fine branching of these uh, neurons are called dendrites. So as you can see, um, and this uh, area, well, this entire neuron is just filled with dendrites. Um, if there's a lot of dendrites, um, this is called a dendric arbor. So arbor like tree, dendric tree. Um, and, but some neurons have very few dendrites. Um, and at birth, you have very few dendrites. And as you grow your first year of life, you accrue more and more. And uh, as I have a son that is five months old right now, you can start to see that at first his motor functions are really poor. If you try to give him something just to grab, we take for granted all these simple things that our neurons are telling us to do, like grab this, click this mouse, type this. Um, if you hang something while he's on his back, he would be really struggling to grab it. Um, now he's, uh, he's five months into his life, and so he's able to kind of grasp things because these uh, dendric arbors and these uh, dendrites are starting to kind of fill in and, and provide this fine motor function that was missing before. Um, and so uh, in a fully developed human, uh, the cerebrum connects to over 10,000 other neurons. So this is a very you know, complex network that's developing here. Um, and so in this picture here, um, we have a Purkinje neuron, um, and this has like a very elaborate uh, dendritic uh, processes. Um, and so if you look very carefully here, um, these little, uh, kind of where I pointed for before, um, it looks like they're hairy. Um, and so these are um, postsynaptic uh, protrusions or spines um, that come off of this, these branches of this neuron. So uh, the second type of cells in the uh, central nervous system are glial cells, G-L-I-A-L uh, cells. And these come in three types. The first is uh, oligodendrocytes, and these are insulated ax or these insulate axons uh, to ensure that the electrical signal does not disperse incorrectly. So just like your electric uh, um, power at your house, uh, you have insulation on the wires to prevent that from arcing or from uh, sending the current down something that it's not supposed to. Um, so these produce membranes called myelin sheaths for this purpose. So myelin sheaths, you can think of that similar to that uh, um, the rubber 
um, coating that goes on wires for insulation. Um, so this sheath is also responsible for the longevity of neurons. Um, and if you remove this, um, this leads to the development of uh, MS, uh, multiple sclerosis. Um, so uh, in the peripheral nervous system, um, myelination is done by uh, these cells called Schwann cells, which we'll get into a little bit more later. Next two type of uh, glial cells in the CNS are astroglia, um, which were first thought to be kind of the glue that holds the, uh, CN or the CNS together. Um, but now it's thought that they play an important role in the blood, <laughs> blood brain barrier, um, as well as immune response, such as uh, responses to inflammation um, and maintaining this uh, homeostatic um, uh, status, I suppose, uh, of the brain. And then lastly, we have microglia, um, which are immune cells uh, for the brain and the central nervous system. So these cells are what are um, help or which help to um, respond to attack, uh, viral attack, etc. Um, and they also they uh, engulf broken glia cells um, and, and help with the uh, repair of glial cells, um, and they're very modal, so they're able to kind of respond to areas that are being attacked uh, within the CNS. <clears throat> so some of this may be a little bit of review, uh, depending on your background uh, with uh, whether psychology or neurobiology or or even general biology may have addressed some of this, but <clears throat> for those of you that are unfamiliar, we're going to look at the actual parts of a neuron. Um, and so uh, neurons obviously transmit uh, electrical signals or uh, information within the CNS. And here we have a motor neuron. Um, so the electrical impulses here are indicated uh, by the red arrows. And so I will highlight them with green arrows. We have a Christmas theme here. Um, <clears throat> and so these electrical impulses are received by the dendrites, which are these kind of branches uh, up on the top here. And uh, the neuron is then stimulated, and this transmission impulse uh, goes through the axon, uh, which is this long part here, to the target tissue. Uh, axons, depending on where they're in your body, uh, can be up to uh, two to three feet long. Um, and this process, this axon, is which, uh, uh, through which the signal is sent. Um, at the end, we have this growth cone uh, right here. And so as it's growing, that part is kind of leading the growth. Um, and it's a local motor uh, and sensory apparatus. So it controls both muscle uh, function, flex, etc., as well as senses its environment and actively explores the environment um, and picks up directional cues as it's growing uh, to determine where to go. So if you were to move that, remove that growth cone, uh, the neuron wouldn't grow and connect to the tissue that it's supposed to. Um, that's kind of what is leading the charge to find out uh, what muscle it's, it's supposed to eventually connect to. Um, eventually though, that growth cone will form a connection or a synapse um, similar to, uh, let me find my cursor, similar to uh, these synapses uh, that are connecting to a dendrite. Um, but it will connect it with its target tissue, whether that's muscle or uh, the heart, which I guess is muscle, uh, liver, kidneys, et cetera. So in the central nervous system, these oligodendrocytes, remember those were uh, one of our cells that we uh, talked about earlier, um, they are responsible for the myelination. And uh, the myelination is that wrapping of myelin around the nerves to provide that insulation. So those signals are carried down that axon as opposed to kind of just dispersing to the local environment. So as you can see here, uh, this oligodendrocyte is kind of providing this myelin uh, to wrap around and protect that axon. Um, and these individual oligodendrocytes will kind of make a node, so to speak. Uh, and so we have what's called a node of Ranvier, which is the these kind of segmental myelin sheaths that surround the axon. So that is those 
uh, oligodendrocytes do their work in the central nervous system. But what about in the peripheral nervous system? So in the peripheral nervous system, we have what are called Schwann cells. And Schwann cells wrap themselves around an axon. So we have this tube. So we're kind of looking down uh, the edge of the tube here. The Schwann cell will wrap itself around and continue to wrap over and over and over, almost like a snake, um, until it is has myelinated this uh, axon. So um, as opposed to oligodendrocytes, which we saw earlier, um, kind of um, have this process that comes out and wraps around uh, the axon, in the peripheral nervous system, these Schwann cells just wrap themselves completely around. So differentiation uh, of this neural tube when it starts to develop into the spinal cord uh, happens differently depending on where along the spinal cord you are. And so uh, we have, during uh, five weeks, the neural tube here. And as you can see, we have a ventricular zone, an intermediate zone, and a marginal zone. So at the spinal cord or up by the medulla, um, you see that we have the vent ventricular zone, and this is the only place that neurons originate from. And they start to migrate uh, further, <laughs> sorry, my uh, arrow is a little off the screen there. Uh, they start to migrate, and they also extend their axons from the ventricular zone all the way to the marginal zone. Uh, now in the cerebellum, uh, there's a second mitotic layer, and this is called the uh, external granule layer, which is on the very outside uh, here. Uh, and this forms a region, uh, the region furthest removed from uh, the ventricular zone, so the furthest outside. And there's a type of neuron cell called a granule cell, which is uh, indicated as these kind of pink cells right here. And they migrate uh, from this layer back into the intermediate zone uh, to form this uh, internal granular layer. And so this is something that is uh, separate from the spinal cord or medulla uh, and is uh, um, specified or more unique to the cerebral cortex and cerebellum. So in the cere uh, cerebral cor uh, cortex, we have these uh, also these migrating uh, neurons and geoblasts that come from this cortical plate, which is kind of under my picture here, but you should be able to see it on your slides. Um, and they start to form this cortical plate, which has six layers, which we'll get into these six layers in a few slides here. So if you remember from our folding of the neurotube uh, that we learned about in the previous chapter, um, we see that this uh, these presumptive dorsal regions, they kind of fold, converge, and then you have separation. Um, but what's important uh, for us to point out here is that the dorsal and the ventral regions of the spinal cord are kind of specified, they're different. And this is delimited by these, this line here between the dorsal and the ventral axis. And this is called uh, the sulcus limitans. And that is the region or the kind of uh, fold or ridge uh, that separates the basal, or sorry, the dorsal and the uh, ventral portions of the spinal cord. So <clears throat> cells from the adjacent somites that we talked about earlier, um, they will form the spinal vertebrae. So those somites are what are responsible for forming the tissue surrounding the nerve, uh, the spinal cord and the nervous system, uh, such as vertebrae. Um, and the neural tube differentiates into the ventricular, um, the mantle, and the marginal zones. So within these uh, dorsal and ventral uh, sections, we have the marginal layer, which is the most outside. We have the mantle layer, which is a little more inside. And the ventricular layer, which is uh, touching that inner cavity or borders that inner cavity. Um, the sulcus limitans, remember, that is the part that divides the spinal cord into the dorsal or alar uh, part, as well as the ventral or basal cart part. Um, and as you can see here, uh, the uh, ventral part is what hosts the motor neurons and connects that to the spinal cord, which goes and uh, interacts with muscles. And the dorsal or alar part is what receives the uh, sensory information 
uh, from your you know temperature sensing cells, pressure sensing cells, uh, etc. So now let's look at the development of the uh, uh, cerebellum um, and the different zones within it. So if we're to zoom in on this, we can see that there's different cell types that make up these layers. Uh, we have granular, uh, granule neurons, which are the innermost layer of cells, as well as Bergman glia cells, which are these uh, little red uh, lines within here. Uh, again, we have these Purkinje neurons that we talked about before. And these Purkinje neurons have processes that go to the external part of the cerebellum. And uh, within these uh, Purkinje neurons are these dendritic arbors. Um, and remember, that's kind of like the branches or the roots that are coming off of this neuron. And some of these dendritic arbors can have over 10,000 plus connections um, between them. So the cere uh, cerebrum also has uh, this layered organization similar to the cerebellum, but it's slightly modified. Um, so it's also uh, organized radially into layers like the cerebellum, where you have an internal, a medial, and an external layer. Um, however, some neural progenitor cells will migrate from the mantle uh, to the outer surface, uh, forming this cortical plate, which will then develop into the neocortex. So it becomes this, uh, this secondary tissue that surrounds uh, the cerebellum. And there's a gene called uh, LHX2, which is required uh, for this developmental process. And so in mice that have knocked out LHX2, you can see uh, this difference in phenotype. So the brown that we are seeing uh, in this developing neocortex is a neocortex marker uh, called SATB2, which is only expressed in the neocortex. And as you can see, if you were to knock out LHX2, we don't get development of this neocortex. We get like a little bit of partial leakage or leaky expression um, of this SATB2 gene. But for the most part, we're not developing that neocortex layer because of it. So as we said before, the neocortex has six layers um, and they all have different functional properties. Uh, we're only going to hit on two of them here. So, uh, for instance, we just need to know that uh, they have different functional properties. Um, but our two examples are uh, layer four, uh, which is the uh, inner granular uh, cell layer. That layer receives input from the thalamus, while layer six, the multiform layer down here, that layer uh, sends their major output to the thalamus. So we have uh, let me change my mark here. So we have outgoing messages from the layer six and the, uh, to the thalamus and then incoming messages from the thalamus to layer four. <clears throat> so this slide is a lot of information, so please bear with me. Um, so the first thing I wanna point out is that the bottom axis, the x-axis here, is time. So we have pre-neurogenesis, neurogenesis, and then we have uh, late neurogenesis and gliogenesis, which I'm kind of covering up here. Now, the y-axis here is the order of birth rate. So this is at what point, uh, what comes later is at the top, and what comes earlier is down here at the bottom. So we'll have an E and an L. Now, uh, so as the neural tube, uh, tube matures, uh, the product of the neuroepithelial cells becomes radioglial cells. Um, so the first thing that we start with early on in pre-neurogenesis is these neuroepithelial cells, and they divide and become more neuroepithelial cells. But eventually, they will transition to become these ventricular radioglia. So there'll be no more uh, neuroepithelial cells at this point here. Now, once we get to this neurogenesis, these ventricular radioglia will divide and become 
another ventricular radial glia, but also a neuron. And so now we have two cell types. As we get further into uh, these intermediate pro uh, progenitors that start to occur during neurogenesis, we have these ventricular radial glia that will divide into another ventricular radial glia. So we're continuing to produce these ventricular uh, radial glial cells. Um, but it will also create this intermediate progenitor cell, which are these uh, kind of goldish colored cells here. Then, as the tissue continues to mature, those uh, intermediate progenitor cells will then develop or uh, divide and produce a pair of neurons. Um, further along, remaining ventricular radial glia will divide and they will become an outer radial glia. And this is as the tissue is getting thicker and becoming uh, more uh, defined. So the ventricular radial glia will become an outer uh, radial glia as well as an intermediate progenitor. Then these outer radial glia, which we had just made, uh, will replicate and make another outer radial glia and an intermediate progenitor. And then finally, when we get into late neurogenesis and gliogenesis, uh, or sorry, uh, gliogenesis, um, some of those remaining ventricular radial glia will become two neurons or they'll become uh, two macroglia. So as you can see, these we start with uh, neuroepithelial cells and we start to differentiate into these kind of subtypes like uh, intermediate progenitor cells, uh, ventricular radial glia, outer radial glia that are kind of an intermediate. They are not quite uh, fully that's not the end product. And then eventually, as we continue along development, you'll develop into neurons or uh, macroglia, et cetera. One additional thing I want to point out is that during the, this developmental timeline, we're developing more and more distinct layers of this uh, cerebral cortex. And so as you can see here, um, very early on, we have developed the ventricular layer. Let me get a different color so you can see this a little better. We've developed the ventricular layer and the uh, second uh, real differentiated tissue is the um, intermediate zone. And then as you can see, because it occurs furthest to the left here, then we have the outer subventricle zone, which occurs here. Um, and then finally, uh, these uh, layers at the top here, the upper layers, who are the upper layers, the cortical plate or neocortex and the deeper layers, um, those uh, occur last in development. So the glia are known to interact with neurons. We had talked about how uh, glia associate with neurons and uh, but they also are known to travel along neurons. And so here we have a neuron, uh, neuron, neuron glia interaction in a mouse that we are observing. Um, and so this is a diagram of a cortical neuron um, migrating on a glial cell process. And so as you can see here, we have um, a neuron that is migrating. And then we have the glial cell process, which is the light blue here. And these are sequential photographs of it migrating up this axis. And so the leading process of this uh, neuron right here, leading process of the neuron, um, has these uh, philopodial extensions um, that are able to kind of pull it up uh, and pull it along that uh, glial process. And so these neurons are able to migrate or along these processes to get to where they need to be, whether it is to replace damaged neurons or to, um, during development, to get to uh, where they're supposed to be to form a tissue. And they can travel at a speed of about 40 millimeters per hour um, as it goes, which is pretty quick if uh, looking at how tiny these cells are and looking how large uh, uh, 40 millimeters is. So 
where these cells migrate, how far they migrate. And remember, if we looked at that complicated slide a couple slides back, the different layers are formed uh, over time. And so the layers one, two, and three are the furthest out, uh, the, the last to develop, while layers four, five, and six are earlier layers to develop. So early on uh, in this experiment, they took a ferret um, cere uh, uh, cerebrum and they radio labeled it with uh, uh, tritium and looked at where those cells migrated to. So early on, this is uh, these neural precursor cells were labeled uh, at embryonic day 29, so 29 days after fertilization, and they found that these migrating uh, neurons will crawl along those glial processes and they will go to layer six. However, later in development, um, this is postnatal day one, so a day after birth, those uh, similar cells that are also tritium um, labeled will migrate further and they will migrate to layers two and three, which were further out if you go refer to that slide previously. Um, so this just is, adds more evidence that as you develop, you develop more and more layers of this uh, cerebrum. So what determines where these cells will migrate to? Well, it turns out that uh, one of the major influences is the cell cycle. So if we were to take early neuronal precursor cells, which are indicated here as these dark blue cells, um, and we transplant them into a older ventricular zone, uh, whether it's within the same tissue or a different mouse that has a mature, uh, uh, or in this case ferret, um, a mature ventricular zone. Um, after these cells have undergone their last mitotic S phase, um, and this is kind of where their fate is sealed uh, as a precursor cell, um, these neurons will migrate along those glial processes to the sixth layer of uh, the, the sixth cortical layer. Now, if we were to take cells that are at a different uh, mitotic phase, and these cells are um, not yet to their last S phase, um, and so they are either uh, in the uh, G2 mitotic phase or in the process of S phase, not after uh, their last S phase, um, they will migrate along those glial cells all the way to cell layer two. So depending on where they are within their cell cycle determines where they will migrate to. So going back to that uh, very dynamic intense figure that we looked at earlier, uh, one of the things you may have noticed is that there's asymmetrical cell division. And that is the cells divide into from one progenitor cell into two different cell types, uh, whether it's a, a neuroepithelial cell and a ventricular cell or a neuron and an intermediate progenitor, et cetera. Um, and so how does this happen? Um, and so what is involved or what uh, carries out this function of this asymmetrical cell division is PAR3, uh, a protein, and notch. And so what happens is uh, very early on uh, in the ventricular zone here, you see we have PAR3 expression. Um, and as we get to metaphase, PAR3 kind of spreads across the cell membrane of this uh, cell, uh, this um, neural progenitor cell in cell, or excuse me, of the stem cell. And uh, then we get to anaphase and telophase. And what will happen is we will have this splitting of the two cells, but one cell will contain much more PAR3 than the other cell. Um, so as you can see here, one cell has a lot of n uh, and the other has a lot of PAR3. And so in cells that have a lot of PAR3, the daughter cells, those cells will start to express a lot of notch, which we can see is this kind of dark orange color here. And those cells, uh, will remain stem cells. And the cell receiving less PAR3 of the two, uh, in this case, uh, we have this kind of light orange color, those will become neuroprogenitor cells. And so depending on the allocation of PAR3, this determines uh, what uh, asymmetrical cell type you develop into.
So if we were to look at cells in the uh, embryonic uh, hindbrain of zebrafish, we can see this in action. So as you can see here, we have a stem cell, and during that anaphase telophase, uh, we get this cell division that is starting to occur. And this bright green color here uh, is that PAR3 gene that has been fused with GFP. So um, it stains this very bright color because it has that green fluorescent protein tag on it. And as you can see, the cell on the left here, uh, if we were to divide the two down the middle, has a lot more of that PAR3. And because of that, it'll lead to the expression of notch, it'll have high notch, and it will remain this um, the stem cell pre or stem cell cell, while the other cell becomes a, a neuronal progenitor cell uh, because it has less of that notch in PAR3 in it. So let's look at brain growth in a species context. And so uh, you may have heard evolutionarily one of the reasons uh, that humans are, have moved so high and kind of place themselves outside of the food chain um, is because of uh, brains, right? So um, the brain to uh, body weight ratio in humans is higher than uh, just about any other animal. And uh, so if we were to compare this to our closest relative, the chimpanzee, we would see that at birth, chimpanzees have a brain to weight ratio where, uh, which is similar to a newborn human, but the development of the, uh, and growth of the brain attenuates. And so it doesn't uh, grow as much as in uh, humans. And so if we look at a newborn human, um, and which is fun for me because I get to see it in my son, um, there's tremendous amount of brain growth uh, after birth in humans. And so there's a lot more generations of neurons. Um, and so this, and you can see it's a direct correlation. So the amount of development after birth for a human is the same rate as before birth. So we're continuing to develop our brains after birth at the same rate as we were inside the womb. Now, if we were to look at this chimpanzee, you can see that the brain uh, growth rate uh, in the uh, womb is the same as humans, but once birth happens, that rate slows down uh, quite a bit compared to uh, human development. So if we were to look at this another way and we look at adult brain weight compared to adult body weight, um, the brain to body ratio uh, in primates, we can see that there is kind of this correlation or this kind of direct line here where we have chimpanzees, orangutans, uh, gorillas, uh, and then down here we probably have macaque monkeys and uh, some other uh, bonobos and other types of uh, primates. but. If we were to look at humans in the context of primates, we have a much, much bigger brain compared to the rest of our body than in any of these other primates. And so uh, if we were talk, to talk to an evolutionary anthropologist, uh, this is one of the theories as to why uh, humans have this higher intelligence compared to the other primates. So uh, one other piece of uh, pop culture, pop trivia that you may have uh, heard about that's associated with intel uh, intelligence is folding in brains. And so uh, two animals that have highly folded brains are elephants and humans, and we call this gyrencephalic, which is G-Y-R-E-N-C-E-P-H-A-L-I-C, gyrencephalic. Um, and so uh, what neurobiologists have noticed is that these highly folded brains are usually, not always, usually uh, associated with intelligence. Now, if we were to compare this to a mouse brain, uh, we would see that there are very few, if any, folds in a mouse brain. And we would call these lysencephalic, which is L-I-S-S-E-N C-E-P-H-A-L-I-C, lysencephalic. And so, uh, so the folds in these brains aren't associated with the number of neurons, but instead with the surface area of the brain. So if we were to compare um, per size, like if we were to scale up a mouse brain to the size of a human brain, 
there would be much more surface area in a human brain because of all these folds and fissures within it. Um, and so this folding uh, of the brain is created by mechanical forces, which are not present in things like the mouse. So if we were to look at um, what makes these folds uh, or jiri in humans, and it turns out there is a gene called H A R H G A P 11 uh, which is found only in humans. Uh, and transcriptional analysis of these glial cells when compared to uh, mice uh, identified uh, that the gene is involved in calcium signaling, cell migration, and activation of um, neurogenin, which is a uh, uh, regulator of transcription, a transcription factor. Um, and so this gene is found only in humans, and it's only found in the radioglial cells. Now, if you're to take ARHGAP11B, so one of the uh, alleles or one of the uh, homologs of this gene, and you were to electroporate it, so you were to take an, a, a developing mouse brain and uh, find a way to put this gene in it, along with GFP, so we can see where this uh, ARHGAP11B is placed into the mouse cell or mouse brain. Um, when we do that, we can see that the mouse starts to f have folds develop in its brain similar to a human brain. So this shows that this gene ARHGAP11B is involved in this folding process. So here again is another uh, microscope image of this developing mouse brain. As you can see, uh, the green cells here indicate the ones that are expressing GFP. Blue is DAPI, which is a stain for nuclei, uh, and SATB2 was that neocortex uh, label. And as you can see, where this green dye is, where ARHGAP11B is, you can see that folding is starting to occur in the brain, indicating that that gene is responsible for folding, and thus it's only expressed in humans. That's why we have such highly folded brains. The last thing we're going to talk about is uh, the myelination of uh, human brains and when it's kind of finalized, right? So uh, a fully myelinated brain is um, a mature brain, right? And a lot of times uh, young individuals believe that when they're 16, 17 years old, oh, they're adults almost, or at 18, they're an adult and they're able to, you know, understand everything and, you know, well, your brain's not fully developed at that point even. It takes until you're about 20 years old where your brain has is a finished product. You have fully a myelinated brain. Uh, and as you can see here, the blue, dark blue regions are uh, regions that have high myelination, while the green is kind of lower and red and purple is very low. So at age five, uh, as you can expect, there's uh, very little uh, myelination happening. And even at age 16, there are regions that are kind of moderate. And it's not until you're about 20 years old and a little bit older that uh, you have a fully myelinated brain. And so you hear some of these ads about like marijuana and alcohol use and stuff in individuals that are not 20 years old and over yet, and that that may have a significant effect on those individuals because their brain isn't fully developed. Even though, you know, we're kind of programmed to believe, oh, I'm 18 years old, I'm an adult, and you're physiologically fully developed, you're able to have kids, you're able to reproduce, et cetera. Um, but brain development is still occurring. So it's not until you're in your early 20s that your, your brain is fully, fully formed. And with that, that's the end of this uh, lecture. Uh, a nice short one, about 39 minutes for you. Um, and we will continue on in chapter 16.